Hello and welcome to Joe and Paul's Another Mining Podcast with me, your host, Paul Harris from Columbia Gold Symposium and Mining Journal and my co-host, Joe Mazumdar from Exploration Insight. Hello, Joe. Paul, oh, how's it going? Very well. And we've got a, a very exciting podcast today. We're joined by not one, not two, but three Lundines today in what's going to be a, a very special uh, discussion about mining in general, m and strategy, all good things such as that. Um, so let's start off by introducing our, our guest. Um, we have Lucas Lundin, the, the father of the, the Lundin Group, and involved in various companies and various different commodities, and Jack Lundin, President and CEO of Bluestone Resources. Good morning, guys. Morning, morning. Very nice to be here. Thank you. Um, I think um, it's, it's perhaps worthwhile starting off with uh, let, let's, a bit of an overview of the Lundin Group and how it, uh, how, how it came about and some of the, the different companies and assets that you have. Uh, okay, originally, you know, we acquired a large asset in unwanted countries and we did the feasibility to drill them out and sold them on, like we did uh, with Musto, International Muscle for the Montasa Mining. And then we saw an opportunity to buy assets that not wanted by the majors. We, we bought Zinker in Sweden from Rio Tinto and added some other assets in Nueva Square we're in Portugal and kept adding assets uh, in Chile, uh, Candelera, Eagle in, uh, in um, Michigan and all that. We were lucky, fortunately, at the right time, assembled enough operation mine to create a mid-sized mining base metal company. So we we originally started off not being operator or developers, but you know, acquiring large assets that were not really wanted by other people. And they were bring them forward and sell them. And now the combination is of uh, producing, developing assets, you know, more mature companies. Lucas, just a question is that when, when you're looking at buying these assets, which are unloved, Let's say, or undervalued, like like Chipata in Yamana that, that mm -hmm. you purchased, or Candelaria in I gather that was Phelps Dodge at, yeah. at, at that time. Is that it? Is it how much is it like your view on the commodity um, in the cycle and and being exposed to nickel, copper, or whatever? Or and how much is it that this is you know misvalued in the portfolio, a willing seller, and how much is it that you're thinking? Well, geopolitically, this is a guy. This is an asset that's getting very highly undervalued because it's Ecuador, because it's Argentina, or it's because of the DRC, or is it a combination of all three? It's a combination of all three, and also you know, we had a lower metal market for a while. So, you know, we got Canada Air with Freeport by, from Freeport because they were heavy indebted when they merged from oh, okay. before oil and gas. And then they had to sell assets. An opportunity came up to be able to buy it. Today, trying to buy Canada Air, it's impossible. I pulled out the copper, nobody would sell it. And same Eagle was a small asset for Rio Tinto. We bought that for nickel asset. Nickel price has been weak, and you know, it's not an asset disposal as an opportunity. Today, I think it'd be much more, much harder to buy producing assets. You know, today, if you're going to build a company, you probably have to build a, build assets yourself, build the mines. Trying to, trying to buy long life producing. Basement assets is very difficult in this market. Do, do you see, like, in, in terms of the development, at least with, with some commodities, we see a paucity of development projects and then, you know, changes in geopolitical risk or taxes or royalties that we're seeing in Chile and Peru? Do you see opportunities there when people are pulling out or holding, you know, putting their foot on the brake? Even, even a large asset could on a stable tax regime, not no is selling. But I see an opportunity like in across the board in Argentina, which I've been now for 30 years. You know, we have found some major copper gold assets and very just an extremely large base metal discovery, one of the biggest in the world in Philo. And I think I see an opportunity in, in that country to advance the get a major mining loss for us. And, better way to develop the project because the money, Argentina needs foreign investments. I think it's a good opportunity in that, that country to move forward quite quickly. And, and you know, when people look at ESG and social governments, governance, sorry, it, it, you guys have been involved in that for a long time, you know, by, you know, by building something in Ecuador that Kinross couldn't 
believe that they you know didn't want to build and and Michigan itself isn't an easy place to build either so how much time or you know uh, resources do you spend on 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 getting the the local stakeholders involved and and you know I getting think, the uh, it's extremely important because you know nowadays you couldn't build an asset or operate an asset that has the social license you have to spend a lot of time the social license has that's is important when getting operating permits. You know, if you, if you can't they make sure that the local region you have involved are not are aren't benefiting, you know, you can have big problems. So social license become more and more important every year. So we spend a lot of time on that. All right. Well, well, you've got a limited amount of time here, but just just to you know leave it with what do you see going forward for the Lundin group? given the current environment, like you say, valuations are pretty high and you don't see a lot of people selling. And you're saying basically the only way is development through expiration than development. Is that what you're seeing? Yeah, or advanced, you know, we, we involved with some company like Josie Marie and Phil, which are super advanced projects. You know, so we can, because the problem. Uh-oh. Can, you know, if we start drilling and finally, if we start building, it's going to take at least 10 years. So if we can find more advanced, you know, project to have a linear from our body and move forward. Now, I'm very bullish that this cycle is going to last for at least 10 years or more. But still, you know, we need to jump a project that have done some work. Just pure green, greenfield projects right today would be very difficult to move fast enough to, to, to for the demand of the copper. All right. Well, and don't forget well, to give about a blue stone to you know, this is a blue stone promo as well. Oh, yeah, blue stone, of course. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to edit that bit out, Paul. No, no. It, <laughs> it, you know it's a progression of the conversation. The, the, the London groups migrated to actually developing, uh, developing and building the projects out as well. It, obviously, uh, Bruder del Norte, London Gold Jack, you were part of the team that built that. And, and now, the, the, the group is looking to do that again, building out, uh, potentially building out um, Cerro Blanco in Guatemala. So it, that, that's quite a big sort of change in direction, isn't it? Change in strategy, change in skill sets and things of that nature. Quite a sort of different, di different business to be in in some ways. Yeah, yeah. If it is, uh, it's a lot, you know, I think if we, if we can find very good assets and put them in production, I think we can create more value by building than selling. And uh, Bluestone, especially, you know, we, we acquired the total underground project. We looked at it, it looked quite difficult. And then we looked at the, the open pit project, and that becomes an, a really good project. Now you're talking trimming asset of one, one gram, one and a half gram at surface, you know, and, and the mine is going to produce three, 200,000 ounces a year. And that's that fair size. So that's that process could become very very exciting by changing the mining method. You know, so we had we had some hard work, and that uh, Jack's going to have some hard work uh, on our, our local stake, stakeholders and social license. Which is super important in Guatemala. Guatemala, I think the Guatemalan government itself is very pro business. It just educated the local population. And, so that. Sorry, that, that was very important in you guys thinking about going from the underground to the open pit was the change in the government. Was was that key? Yeah, we, we went to so sort of president explain it because you know to have a not best experience with the mining industry in Guatemala, so they're a bit nervous. So we had to really explain to him what we're trying to do and get his blessing to an open pit. And I think we got his blessing. Now we just have to make sure we get the local communities on board. And then they you get all that done, then, then it's an amazing project. Just in a bit of background, like, you know, we, we the elephant in the room is Escobar and, you know, and the Tahoe resources debacle. You know, having Pan American now as the owner of that project and the way they handle ESG issues, is, is that helpful to you in terms of advancing Bluestone to know that there's a there's another company in there that's got a solid reputation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Super advantage. They're good guys. And I think Escobar is a great asset. You know, they have some local community issues. And most of the time, you know, it's not only the company, it's not only the country, it's the company and the country, you know, because sometimes we do, we goof up, you know, and the best thing for us is run around and blame Guatemala, which is not a 
maybe we have to look at ourselves so it's like uh, Ecuador, you know, can us blame Ecuador at the end of the day and if you sit down and do a deal with Ecuadorian and we got it, we got it done. You know, so it's a well, two-way street. And, and another aspect uh, that the, the, the Landine group has, you've got the Landine Foundation, the charitable foundation, um, mm -hmm. able to come in and support and augment and, and the, the ESG, the social aspects, um, the company does stuff and the, the, the foundation does stuff. Um, to what extent is, is, is that a, an advantage um, when you're sort of dealing with uh, governments and host communities in countries such as Ecuador and Guatemala, which perhaps haven't had the best experience with mining companies in the past? I think it's been a big advantage, especially in Ecuador, you know, we set up uh, purchasing, I think we, before we start building, we won, I think in the GDP, the local economy was $66 million. We spent $22 million a year before we start building, you know, in the local economy and trying to get local purchasing, you know, tra train local people and, you know, to be able to provide basics for mine, you know, the different food products and milk and meat, you know, so I think the way, you know, if you can get, if everybody sees that they can benefit from the assets we develop, and not only just the federal government, it helps a lot. And the people on the foundation is very helpful. Okay. All right. Well, why don't we uh, make that transition into Bluestone now? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dickers, for joining us.